Uh, so hi everyone, uh, welcome back to this week's One Word Seminar. Today we are very happy to have uh, Professor Yao Qing Yang uh, from the CS Department and Dartmouth College to give us a talk. So he mainly works on uh, machine learning generalization and distributed machine learning systems. And previously he was a postdoc at UC Berkeley. And before that he got his uh, PhD degree in ECE at CMU and special degree from Tsinghua University. Uh, and uh, without further ado, let's enjoy uh, Professor Yang's talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lia. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yao Qing Yang, and uh, I'm a, a new assistant professor at Dartmouth. I basically just joined. Uh, and I used to be a, a postdoc at UC Berkeley. Uh, so today's topic uh, is on the generalization of machine learning models, especially deep neural networks. Uh, we'll mainly talk about some ideas and tools that originate from the uh, statistical physics field and random metric theory and show how they can be applied to deep learning. Also, uh, this joint work with a lot of my colleagues uh, who gave me tremendous support. Um, generalization means the ability to make predictions on the unseen data. So in this talk, we will show that deep learning generalization uh, is actually a very complicated issue and uh, it's hard to obtain something that is uh, universally true. Um, for example, uh, there's a very famous debate on whether one should let the deep neural networks convert to a flat local minimum. So the intuition is usually from this lost landscape plot by Casca et al. Um, the black curve is the training loss function and the red curve is the test loss function. So imagine that we are optimizing our deep neural networks on this uh, 1D lost landscape. Uh, if we converge to a flat local minimum, uh, training and test losses are similar, so the model generates better uh, because the training is close to test. However, if we converge to a sharp local minimum, the training loss, which is the black curve, is small, but the red test loss is big, so the model does not generate. Um, many people have debated about this question. Um, for example, uh, many papers have shown that so the connection between flatness, generalization, uh, and even something like universal robustness um, is not that simple. Uh, and there are, there are a lot of nuances in this part. So uh, many papers have realized that uh, it is uh, not always true that one should let a neural network convert to a flat local minimum. Um, so they have debated about this issue and both sides have given um, some strong evidence. So it's kind of interesting to see is that um, for this same scientific question, uh, different people can have like uh, directly conflicting opinions. So in this talk, we'll use several ways to measure neural networks, and uh, we'll show why people can arrive at uh, very different conclusions about the same question. Um, there are four parts of this talk, and uh, uh, they are quite related to each other, actually. So they are all motivated by uh, statistic, statistical physics, uh, and sort of like looking at the same problem from different angles. Okay, so let's uh, start with the first one. Uh, in the first part, we will look at the phase transitions in deep neural networks. Um, we'll see why it's not always true that flat local minimum general is better. Um, and uh, more importantly, where exactly does that nuance come from? Okay, so uh, let's go back to this debate. Uh, as we have mentioned, you know, different people have uh, different conclusions about this question. Um, so our main conclusion is that there exist uh, multiple phases in deep learning and different phases can generate different conclusions about the same question. Um, so on this slide, we show a so-called phase plot. We'll look at uh, this phase plot in details to understand uh, why different conclusions can arise for the same question. So uh, first let's look at uh, this phase plot. Um, let's look at the X and Y axis. So the X axis, represents the width of the model. Um, so basically, that's just a number of hidden units. Um, so in our ablation studies, we have used uh, other parameters on the x-axis. And uh, all of these parameters, like the width of a model and the quantity of data, represents some notion of the capacity of this machine learning problem. Um, and these parameters actually have a name, which is called the load parameter in statistical physics of learning. So the y-axis denotes uh, the mini batch size used in SGD equation. We also have uh, studied uh, several other choices, um, such as learning rate, algebra, realization, and so on. And these choices that we put on the y-axis 
uh, represent the amount of noise in your SGB algorithm. For example, if you use a large mini batch size, um, then the amount of noise is smaller because you're effectively averaging over more samples. So a large batch size means smaller noise. Um, these parameters also have a name in uh, statistical physics of learning, and they're often called the temperature parameters. Therefore, um, each pixel in this 2D phase bar means uh, one X parameter setting with a specific width and a specific mini batch size used during training. Uh, we'll train five neural networks for each pixel, and then we plot the average test accuracy, which is shown in this color bar. Um, and that is how we get these pixels in this 2D plot. Uh, there are about 200 pixels in this plot, and uh, each pixel has uh, five neural networks. So in total, there are about 1,000 neural networks in this plot. Um, so one thing is that, uh, I mean, we do this experiment, but you know, like when you start your own experiments, you don't need to do it. Okay. So we did this experiment to show a large collection of experiment settings so that uh, we can indeed find all of these phases. Um, so next question is what are these phase transitions or what are these uh, boundaries you know, between uh, different phases? Um, so uh, there are five phases on this plot, meaning that we have found five different types of machine learning problems. And these five phases actually correspond to five different types of loss landscapes. Um, so we we'll skip a little bit details of these five loss landscapes, but the main intuition is that there is one phase transition on the local structure of the loss landscape, which is related to training. And there is another phase transition on the global structure of the loss landscape, which is more related to generalization. So that sort of gives you two multiplied by two equals four phases. Uh, and finally, if uh, both the global and local properties of the loss landscapes are good, you are in the best phase, which is phase four. Uh, then in this case, using the so-called model similarity metric, you can divide uh, this phase further into two, and that gives you five phases in total. Um, so our main conclusion is that phase four B is the best one, and you should always try to get to this phase to get the, the basically the best test accuracy. Um, so to measure uh, both the global structure and the local structures of the loss landscape, we have found uh, several generalization measures uh, that can be used to determine the phases. For example, using the Hessian's leading eigenvalue. So by the way, the, uh, the Hessian is the Hessian with respect to the weights. So using the Hessian's leading eigenvalue, uh, we can determine one of these phase transitions. Um, and you can see that there is an abrupt change in the color. Uh, in this uh, Hessian plot. And that's what we mean by a phase transition. Um, and another important generalization measure is called uh, mode connectivity. Um, and it measures if there exists um, a hidden path in high dimensions that can connect to two local minima. Uh, so this metric studies the connectivity of lost landscapes and that sort of measures some uh, global structure of the lost landscape. Um, so uh, that's basically what we mean by uh, using both the local structure and the global structures. Um, the local structure is measured by Hessian and the global structure is measured by uh, mode connectivity and also uh, model similarity. Okay, so um, after defining these phases, let's uh, uh, see how we can use them to improve deep learning, um, such as uh, the hyperparameter tuning problem that we'll talk about. Um, so notice that this phase part is obtained when you can study all of these different sets, right? So that's what I know because I have already trained thousand neural networks to get this phase plot. However, when you have your own machine learning project, uh, you don't know um, you don't know what the phase part looks like. So when you start your own machine learning problem, uh, let's say you have your own project on CV or NLP, you don't have this uh, phase plot. You only have your own model and your own training. Hyperplant, like in this case, is the batch size, right? So, uh, what you need to do first in this case is to figure out which phase your own problem belongs to without having the whole phase plot. Um, and then, based on the phase, you can choose the best way to improve training. And one thing is that we will show later in one slide that uh, we have studied a lot of different settings and the phase plots are, are quite universal. So, you will see this kind of phases uh, uh, very often uh, in different types of problems. Um, so let's say that you, you now have your own problem. Then this phase plot is like a map and all the generalization measures like 
um, Hessian and mode connectivity and the mode similarity matrix, uh, they are sort of like landmarks that can tell you which phase your problem belongs to. Then depending on where you are, you want to find the best way to get to phase 4B, which is the best uh, phase to get the highest test accuracy. So that's why uh, that, that's how we get this uh, uh, lookup table to determine the phase. So here's the pipeline to use these phases. Um, first, you calculate the three loss landscape measures. Um, Note that calculating these uh, loss landscape measures don't need a, a giant phase plot. Um, then, based on the values of these loss landscape measures, you can determine the phase of your own problem. Uh, finally, you give the treatment or the best uh, solutions to your own machine learning problem. So um, you can get to phase 4B, which is the best phase. Um, therefore, using the framework, you can answer a lot of questions like, should I use a larger model, a smaller model? Should I get more uh, high quality data? Or should I maybe try more hyperparam tuning using the same data? Um, so you can sort of view this as a divide and conquer way to diagnose machine learning failures. So uh, depending on which phase your problem belongs to, you can find the main issue of your machine learning problem. Uh, in some phases, you probably want to use a smaller rate. In some phases, maybe you want to make a new network larger. Um, and they're all based on these phase plots. So, um, so, so that basically gives you a divide and conquer way to determine the best hyperparameters to uh, train your neural network. Uh, so here is an example of using our face plots, uh, which is published in this year's ICML. Uh, we show that using the face plots, you can determine a better way of tuning hyperparameters, uh, and that will give you much faster computation compared to Google research. So we'll actually revisit this slide uh, uh, in this talk, and we will give more details of how to use these face plots to determine uh, the best hyperparameters. Uh, but the high-level idea here is that uh, these face plots provide you a very efficient way to debug your machine learning model and find the best hyperparameters. Um, in addition to hyperparameter tuning, another thing is that you can use these phase plots to achieve a better understanding of deep learning problems. For example, as we have mentioned, uh, many prior works have this debate on flat versus sharp local minima. So uh, in this talk, I will show that whether flat local minima general as well um, or sharp local minima general as well depends on the phase of the problem. Um, so uh, let's look at one phase plot, which shows the so-called double descent phenomenon. Um, so double descent is something that attracts a lot of attention. So it means that the test accuracy has some non-monophonic trends when you vary a hyperparameter of the problem. Um, if you look at the red column in this left plot, you can see that when the mean batch size changes, the color first becomes bright and then becomes dark and then bright again. So that is a typical phenomenon of double descent. Um, however, today we'll not talk too much about double descent because uh, you know, like this is not the main focus of this talk. Uh, but we will show that depending on the phase, the best way to improve generalization um, is uh, different in this setting. Um, so we'll still look at uh, flat and sharp local minima. Um, and in this talk, our primary tool to measure the flatness is to use Hessian. So if we restrict ourselves to the right half of these 2D phase plots, meaning that we only look at uh, wide models, um, you can see that Hessian predicts the test accuracy quite well. Uh, for example, if you look at the column in the red block, uh, then uh, the best test accuracy is indeed achieved with the smallest Hessian or the most uh, locally flat minimum. So this sort of matches what people understand in the past, uh, which is that the flattest uh, local minimum uh, gets the best test accuracy. However, if you look at the left half, now you can see that this conclusion is not true, right? Because, uh, uh, for example, if you look at uh, uh, this red block again, the best test accuracy or the brightest part is achieved uh, uh, in the upper part. So in this case, the Hessian is not the smallest because uh, uh, the smallest the Hessian is at the bottom part. So in this case, the flattest local minimum uh, does not get the best test accuracy. So in other words, uh, if paper A only looks at the right part of this phase plot, its conclusion would be that one should train to um, a flat local minimum. However, if paper B only looks at uh, the left half, then the conclusion should be that you, you, you don't want to train to flat local minimum. However, um, 
our paper says that, well, that's not the complete picture. And if you want to look at a complete picture, you have to look at both sides. Uh, and the right answer is that depends. Um, you should measure the face and then see if you want to train to the flat line. Um, and as we mentioned, the next question is, uh, is our result local? But is it some like cherry pick result, right? So how broad is our result? In fact, uh, uh, we have looked at uh, many face blocks. Uh, for example, different amount of data, different architectures, different temperature parameters, um, different data sets, and the uh, quality of data, which are related to the load parameter, um, and different training approaches. So uh, in all of these results, we show that our conclusions hold, uh, which is that the five phases exist, and one can always get the best test accuracy in phase uh, 4B, uh, which is the phase to get the highest test accuracy. Um, so the reason that we look at so many phase products is because we want to sort of build a general framework and we don't want to restrict ourselves uh, to a local picture. Okay, so I guess this is the end of the first part, which is about phase transitions. And later we'll uh, see how these things can be applied to a few more uh, applications. Um, so I guess I can pause here uh, a little bit and see if there are any questions. Hi, Professor Yang. Uh, just a quick okay. question. That's uh, what motivates you to plot the diagram against the weeds at the batch size instead of other dimensions? Yes, yes. Um, so uh, one thing is that uh, um, you know we looked at uh, the so-called load and the temperature parameters, and these kind of things are actually uh, strongly motivated by uh, statistical physics. Uh, and uh, we'll have a few slides to sort of go over that. Uh, and then after looking at it, you will see that the way that we choose these hyperparameters are sort of very similar to the way that people choose uh, these uh, parameters. Uh, and I guess uh, like one thing is that we do want to sort of uh, uh, build a, a simple model for, um, for deep learning. So it's like, we don't want to, um, you know, have maybe a, a 50 different hyperparameters and uh, get different ways to tune these hyperparameters because that, that is going to be too difficult. So I guess uh, motivation here is sort of like, we want to build this uh, simple model of deep learning so that we only have maybe two different types of hyperparameters, the load parameter and the temperature parameter. Uh, and then the load parameters are sort of things related to the capacity of the neural network, maybe the size of the model, the amount of data you use uh, and the quality of the data, for example, if there is some noise uh, in the data itself. Uh, and then the y axis uh, is uh, is the temperature parameter, which is more related to the SGD noise, maybe you know like batch size, uh, learning rate, those kind of things. Just like one axis, the x axis is uh, the type of problem that you're considering, and the y axis is more like uh, your hyperparameter that you can put during your training process. Um, and uh, I guess like one very interesting phenomenon we see is that uh, even if you change all of these different hyperparameters, for example, you can change the x axis to load uh, to, to other load parameters like the amount of data, you can change the y-axis to maybe learning rates or auto regularization. Then you almost always get like sort of similar type of things plots that sort of uh, support our motivation to study this very simple model of the plan. I see, I I see. Ask, thank you very much. Can I ask one qu uh, short question? How stable are these observations say over the depth of the neural network? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so uh, one thing is that uh, um, in our experiments, we haven't really looked at uh, depth. So that's one thing I think uh, um, this paper lacks. But then uh, in some uh, 23 paper, we indeed looked at depth. So in that paper, we have an experiment related to the depth of the model and our observations are very similar. Um, you know, for depth, so like one thing is that uh, it's uh, going to be entangled with the temperature parameters. So it's like if you look at depth and you just change it, then you have to somehow change the hyperparameter as well to get the best test accuracy. So that sort of adds to some nuance of uh, uh, this experimental procedure. But, uh, you know, if you take care of that, then you will see the same phenomenon. Thank you so much. And then uh, what depth do the experiments here have? Oh, so, so here, this is a ResNet 8. Okay, ResNet 8. thank you. Yeah, okay, so uh, maybe let me move on. Um, okay, so in the uh, next part, uh, we will see another application, uh, which is network pruning. 
So uh, network pruning is a technique to compress a neural network by removing redundant weights. Uh, in this case, uh, we also have a hyperparameter tuning problem. For example, in some cases, you want to um, prune more, and uh, maybe in some cases, you probably want to do early stopping or use a smaller learning rate or so on. Um, so the main difficulty of the hyperparameter tuning in this case is that we have a three-stage problem, right? And uh, this is uh, probably the most commonly used pipeline for network pruning. Um, so in the first stage, you will portray your model to some degree. Um, then you prune your model based on some criteria. For example, the most common way to prune is just to remove weights with a small magnitude. Um, and finally, you will fine tune your model. Um, now you have three stages and there are some hyperparameter in each stage. So our question is, can we somehow characterize the phase transition for these hyperparameters? Uh, one thing to mention here is that we will use the term model density to describe the size of the pruned model, which is the ratio of remaining weights to the original weights. So if you think about model density, you immediately realize um, there is a connection uh, between this problem, this hyperparameter tuning problem, and uh, um, our phase plot. Uh, and the reason is that uh, phase plots have one dimension to show the so-called load parameter. And just to remind you, the load parameter is on x-axis of this phase plot, uh, which is related to the size or capacity of the neural network. So um, it's clearly something uh, highly related to the model density of the point. Uh, and the, the y-axis is the temperature parameter, which is uh, the amount of noise used during training. So for our network uh, uh, pruning problem, uh, on the x-axis, we use the model density after pruning as the load-like parameter. And on the y-axis, we use the train epochs during the training um, as a temperature-like uh, parameter. Um, then uh, we want to ask you two questions. The first one is, uh, can we actually observe multiple phaseful regimes for this network pruning problem? Uh, and the second is that, can we quantify these regimes using the loss landscape metrics that we have used to determine the phases in the first part of the talk? Uh, maybe you want to use model uh, connectivity, or maybe you want to use some other type of metrics, but the problem is that, can we actually locate uh, this decision boundary uh, between different phases? Uh, so it turns out that we can. Um, it turns out that uh, uh, for network pruning, there are three regimes which still correspond, correspond to uh, three different types of uh, loss landscapes. Um, and these three regimes uh, lead to a very interesting dichotomous phenomenon. So depending on which regime your model belongs to, uh, you have to use different ways to tune hyperparameters. For example, if you are on the left side of this plot, uh, you should increase your temperature parameter uh, but uh, if you are uh, on the right side of this plot, uh, you should decrease your temperature parameter. Um, and uh, so how do you determine the phases? Well, it turns out that uh, you again use mode, mode connected, um, as well as uh, the semantic measures that we mentioned in the first part. Um, so note that in this example, the temperature parameter is the number of training epochs during the pre-training stage. So you basically can answer the question, should I do early stopping? Or not right because now uh, the question is that we observe this uh, autonomous phenomenon and depending on which phase you are in, you probably want to tune your hyperparameters in different ways. And our answer is again, it depends. It depends on the phase your problem belongs to. Um, now, if you look back, uh, you will see that what we have uh, on this slide uh, are almost uh, exactly the same. You know, for uh, the uh, the flat versus sharp local minimum problem. Right? Should I train to a flat local minimum? Well, it depends on the phase. Um, on the, if you are on the right side of this phase part, you should, but if you're on the left side, then you should not. So that's a dichotomous phenomenon again. Um, as we have shown uh, on this slide, it's uh, exactly the same answer for uh, network pruning. Uh, so now, uh, how does this idea compare to uh, other baselines? Uh, well, as we have mentioned, we want to see if we want to do early stopping or not for pre-training, right? So let's just look at this problem. Um, in other words, we would like to uh, determine the best epoch to early stop. So that is uh, a better way to ask this question. Should I stop at epoch 10? Should I stop at epoch 20? Or maybe should I just continue to train forever? Um, so now there are two conventional wisdoms. The conventional wisdom one is that we should train the model to completion before pruning. So, you know, it turns out that uh, this is uh, something that people often use. You first train your model to the smallest training loss possible, and then you prune, right? 
Uh, but this is bad because uh, we know that based on our three regime model, we should do early stopping sometimes. So it's not always good to train to completion. Uh, then conventional wisdom two is that we should do grid search. Uh, but clearly it is not good because uh, grid search is too costly. Right? So um, how does our result compare to this? Well, so if we compare to conventional uh, wisdom one, uh, we show that uh, we achieve best at test error because uh, it's not always true to train to completion and you have to early start sometimes. Um, and if you compare our method to grid search, you can see that our method uses a much shorter training time. Um, and the reason is that in grid search, you always have to go to the second stage, which is the fine tuning stage. Um, however, in our method, we do not necessarily need to do that. So in many cases, we can just measure our phase and exclude some unnecessary hyperparameters that you need to search for. So that turns out to save a lot of computation uh, compared to grid search. Um, again, we can look at many different data sets and different architectures. It turns out that our method always achieves almost the best test accuracy without going all the way um, to uh, something like grid search, which can save a lot of uh, computational cost. Okay, I, I guess this is the end of the second part. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, uh, if not, uh, let's move to the third part, which is uh, another application of uh, these phase plots. Um, so, um, you know, like one thing is that um, um, there is again a fourth part. So I actually think that maybe the, the third part will be a little bit short uh, because of that. Um, uh, but I, I still want to sort of convey my main message. Um, so in this part, we'll look, we're going to look at ensembling. So ensembling is a technique to uh, combine the outputs of multiple learners. So the main idea is that you want the models to be diverse so that uh, you can use majority votes uh, to reduce uh, error. Um, so by the um, Condorcet's jury theorem, you have, uh, if you have independent votes, um, you can have a more accurate decision using majority vote, as long as uh, each vote has uh, some error probability smaller than one or two. However, um, we would like to ask the question, when are ensembles really effective? Um, so what do we mean? Well, in this case, we consider a new way of measuring the performance gain of ensembling. Um, in particular, we consider something called the ensemble improvement ratio or EIR in short. Um, so that is defined as the ratio between the ensemble improvement and the average individual loss. So uh, in this case, the numerator is the expected individual uh, test loss subtracted by the um, ensemble test loss. And the denominator is the individual test loss. So the idea is that we don't really care about the absolute value of uh, ensemble improvement. Uh, and we care more about uh, the relative improvement. Um, and we think that this can sort of help measure when ensembling are really effective. For example, you, know, you can uh, think about some cases like uh, you have a very small test accuracy, right? Um, and then when you do ensembling, maybe you can reduce uh, the test accuracy from maybe 2% to 0.1%. And if that is the case, ensembling actually brings a lot of gain. But if you just look at the number, it's just a 2% gain, right? But if let's, the, let's say that you have 20% uh, uh, test error, and in that case, uh, you use ensembling, and that probably changed the um, test error to maybe 18%. And in that case, you know, the, the improvement is still 2%, but uh, um, relatively, it is not a big deal, right? So uh, since we consider this, we want to sort of uh, consider relative improvement instead of uh, um, the absolute improvement. And then to study this problem, we also define a metric called the uh, disagreement error ratio uh, or DER. Um, so it is the ratio between the expected disagreement between the classifiers inside the ensemble uh, and uh, the individual test loss. Um, again, this is a metric that sort of uh, measures the relative uh, improvement. Um, now our main conclusion is that first, uh, ensemble improvement ratio, which is ER, um, are tightly correlated with uh, uh, DER, right? So actually you can prove a theorem. So in this case, you can prove a theorem which shows that uh, these two things are basically upper and uh, uh, lower bound. 
uh, of each other. Um, and our second conclusion is that these two quantities have a phase transition at the so-called interpolation threshold. So um, on one side, um, you have a very high EIR and on the other side, you have a relatively low EIR. And the important thing is that there is a big jump between these two regimes. Um, so you can again ask, uh, uh, are ensembles really effective? Well, the answer is again, it depends, right? It depends on the phase of your problem. Um, so this is the end of the third part, which is uh, you know, another application of uh, phase plots to, uh, to, to different problems. Um, and I want to uh, give a brief summary, um, sort of uh, connect to a little bit of big picture of uh, this line of research. Um, so first, uh, machine learning loss depend on the phase. If you're in a different phases of machine learning, you will probably have very different conclusions about the same scientific question. Um, and look at, uh, uh, you know, and if you look at these different problems, um, this way of thinking can lead to, you know, many new theories and the new algorithms. Uh, for example, the ensemble learning theory that we have derived uh, um, in the first paper and uh, the network pruning algorithm that we have shown in the second paper. So um, some of these are still ongoing work, so I have skipped a lot of details, but I guess uh, you can sort of understand uh, the general way of studying these phase plots and why I'm putting them together. Um, so the general idea about this line of research is to study the interplay between load and temperature parameters um, that we mentioned earlier. So the load parameter here includes size of the model, quantity or quality of data, um, and uh, it can also include something like the pruning ratio. So it measures the capacity of the model in some sense. Um, then the temperature parameters can be uh, the different tuning hyperparameters like batch size or any way so on. Um, therefore, this way of thinking tries to classify all different hyperparameters into two major categories so that we can get a very simple model of deep learning. Um, so before I move to the next part, I want to comment on a few things about this particular way of thinking, which is motivated by studies of physics of learning. Um, so you might think that a lot of things uh, uh, in this talk are just, you know, like some strange phenomena, right? So, uh, but actually many prior works, especially those in the 90s, have studied a lot of these phase transitions. Uh, and uh, these results are mostly uh, for small scale uh, models. And I've listed a few of them here. Uh, like the Hopfield networks, the Septron, the uh, three parity machines, and so on. So for these models, people have got uh, very strong theoretical results using uh, the analytical tools uh, from uh, statistical physics and uh, information theory. Um, so you know, like for this type of problem, it's very easy to do like very exact analysis. So you can actually exactly these phase transitions uh, very exactly. However, uh, due to some historical reasons, this way of uh, analyzing neural, uh, neural networks are not as popular as things like VC bounds or rather more complex or so on. Um, so uh, many people have questioned uh, the current theories of deep learning based on you know basic dimension and so on, uh, and they sort of uh, want to understand deep learning um, and uh, want to rethink deep learning and want to sort of connect to new ideas. So I think uh, now that we need to rethink deep learning. Uh, the ideas from statistical physics uh, could be very useful, especially if we study very large scale problems. Um, so uh, I will be very happy to discuss more about this uh, in the near future and see how we can apply this, um, uh, these tools from statistical physics to something beyond the generalization of deep learning. Okay, so before I go to the next part, uh, please let me know if you have any questions. So um, I guess uh, uh, in the final part, uh, again, um, we'll look at something motivated by the physics uh, and it's related to the so-called uh, uh, random matrix theory. But the main idea here is that we want to uh, really go from theory to practice now and uh, we will use these uh, loss landscape metrics um, and use them for training neural networks and uh, uh, do something like model selection of uh, very large scale transformers. Um, I will again start by giving some motivation to this part. Uh, so here I show the picture of the Hugging Face website. Hugging Face now uh, is one of the best websites that you can download uh, uh, pre-trained uh, natural language processing models. Uh, there are about 25,000 models on this website. Uh, now let's say that you are trying to find a model that is suitable for your task from these 25,000 models. Which one should you pick? 
Um, so the question is that in this case, the data might not be available to you uh, because these models might be trained using some web scale data set or maybe using some private uh, data sets. Uh, but most of the generalization measures in the literature are data dependent. So this include uh, uh, metrics based on the classification margins uh, or the so-called uh, pack Bayesian bounds. Uh, therefore, the key is to find something that can measure uh, the model performance and help you select uh, these models uh, without accessing the training or testing data. Um, so it turns out that uh, what you can do um, is to still use something that is sort of motivated by statistical physics uh, and uh, uh, like those law landscape metrics. And in this uh, particular problem, um, so what you do is that you will look at the weight matrix of a neural network and then you do some spectral analysis on these weight matrices. So for example, you can compute the empirical spectral density of the correlation matrix W transpose W. Um, so what you do is that you will uh, take these weight matrices uh, and then get the eigenvalues and then plot a histogram and we call that the empirical spectral density. And then you fit some form of power law distribution on the tail of the spectral densities. Um, and using the results of fitting, you can measure the shape of these spectral densities in different ways. And uh, we call the generalization measures from these procedures uh, the, the shape metrics. So uh, here are some results on model selection using shape metrics. Um, so we have six figures here, which represent uh, six different shape metrics. And uh, none of them needs the access to training or testing data. Um, and in each subfigure, we have 200 transformers for machine translation trained with different hyperparameters. Um, and we, um, you know, I group them using a different amount of data. So each curve sort of represents a fixed amount of data. Uh, we select the best model inside each group, which mimics the common hyperparameter tuning procedure. Then we measure if we can use these shape metrics to rank the optimally trained models. Okay. So uh, from these plots, we can see that uh, uh, the optimally tuned models or the models that are marked with these black stars um, are all perfectly ranked by all the generalization metrics. So what I mean is that if you only look at these black stars on each plot, you can see that when the generalization metrics become smaller, the blue score, uh, which measures the quality of machine translation becomes high. So in all of these plots, the generalization measures sort of follow this rule, uh, which means that uh, these generalization uh, metrics are useful. Um, so this part actually points out uh, something that is a little bit subtle, but uh, very important about using these uh, generalization metrics for model selection. So let's just uh, look at the first part uh, in detail. So if you look at the first part uh, and you look at the gray line here, uh, which contains a mix of uh, well-trained and non-well-trained models, you can sort of artificially create uh, the anti-correlation between the blue score and the generalization metrics. Right? So uh, one thing that might be confusing here is that uh, when I say any correlation, I actually mean that the blue score uh, have a positive correlation with the generalization metrics, and this is showing this uh, gray line. Um, so due to the so-called Occam's razor, the correlation should be the other way around, meaning that if you have a larger generalization metric value, the blue score should be smaller. So the black stars uh, have the correct correlation, uh, but the, uh, these um, gray squares, you know, show the wrong anti-correlation. So what I'm trying to say here is that applying this shape metric sort of requires you to focus on uh, the optimally trained models. If you say, oh, I would just pick some random models and I hope that uh, a generalization metric can be used to rank this model, uh, then you basically get uh, nothing useful. Okay, so let's uh, uh, take these generalization metrics to the wild and let's directly apply them on the hacking phase transformers and see how well they work. Uh, so the, the bar plot here shows the probability of correctly selecting the best model from a group of hacking phase transformers. But uh, um, so we're only trying to measure like one generalization metric. So we want to use one generalization metric to just uh, rank all of these uh, uh, hacking phase uh, transformers performance. Um, so there are eight series of models that we consider here, which cover almost all the hacking phase transformers. So um, from this bar plot, we can see that the shape metrics that are colored blue, uh, which are the metrics motivated by these parallel distributions, perform uniformly better than norm-based metrics, which are commonly studied in the literature. Um, however, I guess uh, it's sort of reasonable to say that uh, these results 
here uh, are not really that impressive because uh, you know if by looking at this plot, there's only like one metric which just gives you like the best performance. Uh, but still, we can sort of uh, show that the shape metrics generally work better than scale metrics. And as I have mentioned, there is some nuance here that you have to look at the really well-trained models and then apply these metrics. If you don't do that, then you can sort of create these anti-correlations. Okay, so uh, a reasonable question to ask at this stage is that, um, so now we compare the shape-based metrics and norm-based metrics, but uh, why does the norm-based metrics not work? Right? What is the main issue here? Uh, well, we found that the norm-based measures don't work because uh, these measures are mostly correlated with so-called uh, generalization gap of a model, uh, instead of uh, something that can really measure the quality of uh, these machine learning models. So if you ask me what is the, uh, you know, what is the definition of uh, model quality, well, um, the test time performance, like blue score, can be good proxies of the model quality. So if you care about machine translation, uh, the, you know, like the uh, model quality can be the blue score. Uh, and if you care about image classification, then maybe the test arrow can be a good thing to look at. Um, however, uh, the generalization gap is just, you know, not the right thing to look at. So um, in fact, many papers on the generalization measures have focused on the generalization gap. Um, here are some papers in this area. So they all measure generalization gap instead of the test, uh, test error, or test accuracy itself. Um, so one thing was noting is that the generalization gap is sometimes called the generalization arrow, uh, but that is just the same thing, which is the gap between the training and test. So if you wonder why people um, always look at the generalization gap, well, that's because the common ways of driving the generalization bounds try to bound the generalization gap instead of the test arrow itself. Right? So it's like if all of these papers that from some theoretical research in machine learning, then they will tend to look at the generalization gap and try to derive some metric that is uh, correlated strongly with the generalization gap and not necessarily with uh, test accuracy or test error. So uh, in the following part, I will show some experimental results which show that uh, the correlation uh, between this metric and the generalization gap can be you know, totally independent from the correlation between uh, this uh, generalization metric and the test accuracy or test error. Okay. So they can actually show the different trends. So uh, in this part, uh, I'm showing you the comparison between 28 different generalization measures. Uh, the shape metrics are colored blue. So these are the metrics that are motivated by statistical physics. Uh, the other existing generalization measures like margin, pack Bayesian, and so on uh, are colored with that. Uh, and the yellow ones are the hybrids, just like uh, some combination between the shape metrics that we design and the existing generalization measures. Um, so if you have a bar that is to the right, it means that the correlation with uh, the blue score is higher. It means that uh, the generalization metric is more useful and is better in predicting the blue score. Um, so one thing to note is that for each metric, we'll have a bar instead of uh, one number of correlation because we have conducted uh, like 200 experiments for each bar uh, by varying different hyperparameters. So each bar uh, represents the distribution of uh, 200 uh, correlation numbers. So uh, if you calculate the correlations between these measures and the blue score, um, then our metric or the blue ones are better because the blue bars are more to the right than the red bars. However, if you measure the correlations to the generalization gap, then, you know, the story completely changed and the non-based generalization measures are better. So these are the existing measures that people have studied. So the main conclusion for this section is that, you know, um, the shape metrics not need data, which is great. And uh, these metrics actually predict the model quality or predict the test accuracy, test uh, error or blue score directly instead of looking at the generalization gap. So the existing measures are not really, you know, they, they work. Right, so they work in the problem that they have defined, but the problem is that uh, the connection to a generalization gap is probably probably not uh, like uh, the most uh, useful thing to look at. Right, and in this paper, I guess uh, what we are trying to do is to design some metrics that can be used directly for model selection, like uh, selecting like these transformers. And in that case, you really need some metrics that are correlated with the test time performance instead of uh, the generalization gap. Um, 
And finally, I guess uh, this slide uh, is about uh, like some training results. So we're also trying to apply these uh, shape metrics, uh, which are sort of motivated by physical physics and uh, uh, random metric theory to the training of neural networks. So on this slide, uh, different figures represent uh, different networks and different bars inside each figure represent models with a different number of channels with different uh, uh, model width. So we'll see um, that our method outperforms uh, this baseline on a lot of different types of neural networks, VGG16, VGG19, ResNet18, and ResNet34. I'll save our own. So uh, basically it shows that we can actually utilize these shape metrics to improve training of uh, neural networks. And one thing is that this is a work in progress. So we are currently are trying to uh, like look at a lot of more different uh, data sets, uh, different types of problems and so on, and try to see if this uh, phenomenon in training uh, is universal. Okay, to briefly summarize this part. Um, so we basically focus on uh, generalization measures that do not need access to data mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, and this is because, you know, like, although we have built uh, the framework of phase transitions, we still need uh, data to compute the phase. Uh, and we find that the shape matrix derived from the spectral analysis of the weight matrix um, can um, measure the model quality inside of the generalization gap, and it does not really need access to training or testing. Data. Okay, uh, and this is the end of the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Yang, for this great talk. Um, let me pause the recording and we can have some Q&As.